friends of mine in Holland did this. Um, they worked um, with uh, farmers and fishermen on an island off to Schelling in the north, uh, um, off, the, off the coast of Holland. And what they did was, uh, over a number of years, in fact, they photographed people, they interviewed people, they made sound collages, and they then assembled it systematically over a number of summers as a whole kind of um, exhibition. And um, people were very proud of their, um, their portraits. They were very proud that anybody took them seriously. Uh, it was celebrated in the course of a, a festival. And it was not dissimilar from the, um, the ideas that Phil and I were talking about and we put an application into NERC, which failed, to work with farmers in the Eden Valley, actually celebrating their herds, having photographs of their work, putting in a, a big exhibition of this kind up in one of the new cattle markets, possibly in Carlisle, and also taking a small exhibition around various uh, festivals and showgrounds, so that um, the, the, the farmers, in particular in case of the Eden Valley, uh, were taken seriously and were valued and they were, and they were celebrated. So essentially you're building up a relationship of trust which is what we've been talking a lot about today in terms of uh, um, collaborating stakeholders and so on. We're building up a set of a, a trust through an event, through something which is, which is visceral and is um, um, connected and is sensual and is poetic. Because I think a lot of the time we are all obliged, and it's part of our education system, that we are obliged to work through kind of top head, head down communication. And that I think a lot of the time we can communicate through an entirely different process. I just went to the Bruce. Springsteen concert in Sunderland, the other night, 30,000 people there, and talk about communication and talk about truthful poetry. Those people were engaged because it was visceral, it was sensual, and it was an artwork of a populist uh, kind. And I'll end with a few quick images working with, some of you probably know Professor Peter Matheson. He was the man who um, um, investigated the toxic paint which was put on the bottom of the ship, and he managed to stop it a few, few years back. Uh, he's now retired, he lives near me, and we, uh, we work together. He wanted, and this is my point about scientists, that actually he was saying, you know, I never really had a chance to communicate the wonders that I felt as a child, like Nobel with his chemistry set in his garden shed. You know, I really got into science because I loved what I found. I was amazed by it, these great discoveries, but I got into so much detail, so much intensity, so much academic work, so much of the whole question of um, actually... Um, working through research organizations, through government organizations, through market-led organizations and initiatives, that I've lost the sense of why I started it. I wanted to express the wonders. And as an artist, I, was, I felt I wanted to make an expression of the wonders too. I was thinking, what would William Blake have done if he'd had microscopes? And so we went and we did audits of, uh, of um, a trail. I live in a beach house on the other side of Morecambe Bay from here. And we made a whole kind of orbit around the bay, and we did a, um, a, question, a, a measuring of the critters, the microbes in critters, uh, at, at intervals, and we did it through a whole uh, a seasonal period. And I was staggered. I mean, people think of the bay as a, a wet Sahara, and I'm sure you guys know it's completely different. Uh, but I couldn't believe that in one square meter you'd find 29,000 microbes critters. You know, then you think, how the tonne do we get there to there? And it was this sort of wonder that I felt with the Rock Trilogy, wanted to show to people because they were frightened of it. They were frightened of it because they were ignorant. And they were ignorant just as they were of the water courses in Ulverston that were alive going underneath. And interestingly, now, one of those water courses has come out as, a, as being a barrier to building a supermarket because the supermarket is next to the car park with water underneath it. So now they are knowing about the water and they do care, but it's about commitment and knowledge and reason to know. But the ignorance was something that we wanted to... Uh, um, to leave them and, and so on. So here we are, finding critters in the bay, digging, uh, digging them up, putting them through into petri dishes. Thanks to the university here and Phil's uh, department, we, we got video film through cameras, which is uh, wonderful. Uh, we involved the children as well, which is, again is another way, I think, of learning. We tend to separate schools, we tend to separate children out and become certain learning patterns. And I think if we can bring these things together, thinking of it more holistically, thinking of it from a sociological position, then we can all kind of uh, be um, enamored or terrified as, as I was when I saw this at this scale. I saw it on a microscope. A mud shrimp or a um, nearest worm with jaws like lobsters. Like, I couldn't quite believe. You know, and, and, and then started to fantasize. Thank hey, God they're not the size of this room. You know, we wouldn't be, I wouldn't be here talking to you. And um, uh, the worms and uh, shells and this lovely uh, Baltic pelling shell, which uh, I did, I said to Sarah, it looks like a lonely spot.
spaceship trying to make sense of these things. And back to that question at the end of um, what are we communicating? What do we need to communicate? What is vital? What are our priorities? What is it that we actually want to put together with all the knowledge we have? There's so much knowledge, so much information, so much data. It's so complicated. We have to work together. We have to, I think, um, tell wonderful stories and tales uh, to our uh, to our grandchildren. And I think it was... I think people are scared, you know, and we need to communicate as well as we can. And uh, I think it was T.S. Eliot um, said... In 1944, which is an awful long time ago, in his um, poem, which you probably know, four quart, in the Four Quartets, Burton Norton, 1944, this is an ecological fable. Go, 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 said the bird. Humankind cannot bear very much reality. Time present and time future, what might have been and what has been, point to one end, which is always present. Which I think brings together science and poetry and hopefully you and me and you men.